Hello everyone, my name is Helsey. Welcome to another international Sunday school lesson where we give an overview of the lessons based on the standard lesson commentary. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe, or even to leave a comment. So we're in unit three of our fall quarter and we are still in the study of God's exceptional choice. All the lessons in November will be focusing on We Are God's Artwork. Bible scripture for today, Sunday, November 6th, will be taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through verses 14. Lesson title is God Picked You. Before we start our lesson, let's open up in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for these reminders of your guaranteed blessings, the blessings of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is guaranteed. And it is by the Holy Spirit that we are sealed until the day you return. Help us, Lord, to live our lives to glorify you. Bless every listening ears. Bless every unsaved hearts. Save them, Lord Jesus. Save them. Open up their eyes. Let them see the need that they have for a Savior. Cause them to cry out, what must we do to be saved? We thank you, Lord, for ever teachers. Give understanding. Make us one in you, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings and these things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this lesson will be outlined and it will be divided into two sections. Section one will deals with greetings from Paul to the faithful. And that's Ephesians chapter one, verses one through verses two. Section two will deals with unbridled blessing of God through Christ. And that's verses four through verses 12. And so for all these lessons in November, they will be coming from the epistles of Ephesians. Today, our lesson starts in chapter 1. We will see in chapter 1 how the Apostle Paul reminds the church, the believers, of the glory and the promises of God and what that means to us as believers. Paul here, as a reminder to all believers, that the promises of God is secure and it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. He also described the provision of a redeemer, meaning the Christ. In the in the uh, book of Peter, first Peter chapter one, Peter also touched on that provision Christ being the redeemer so in first Peter chapter 1 and start at verse 18 he says for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you have inherited from your ancestors and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver he paid for you with the precious life blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. And so when we talk about the word ransom, it carries that idea of being bought back, being paid for. In Bible days, a slave was ransomed. When someone was paid money to buy his or her freedom. And so here we see that word is used again where God 
ransom us from the tyranny of sin, from the bondage of sin, not with money, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Again, we owe Jesus thanks for all that he has done for us. We will now go to section one and it will deals with Paul's greetings. Verse one, reading from New Living Translation. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. It is written to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. And so here in verse 1, we immediately sees a greeting and Paul making a declaration that this letter is from Paul. He explained that his authority to be an apostle is from Christ. He also go on to say he was chosen as Christ's messenger to spread the good news, to spread the gospel. The word apostle can also be referred to as a messenger and, and serve as an official title for Paul and also for the 12 disciples, the ones who were eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection. And these apostles were chosen by Christ. And that laid the foundation of the gospel. And we can see that uh, Paul also wrote that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 12, Paul says, when I was with you, I certainly gave you every proof that I am truly an apostle sent to you by God himself. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. And here again, we see how Paul uh, was verifying his authority as an apostle. Back to the lesson. Verse 2, Ephesians 1, verse 2. May grace and peace be yours, sent to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Here Paul is pointing out that true peace, just like true grace, comes from the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so he uses the conjunction and, and that indicates the equal divine power that the Lord Jesus is equally divined with the Father. And we can take a look at, take a look at John chapter 14, starting at verse 8. John 14 verse 8. And here we will see Jesus declaring to be equal with God. Verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am? Even after all the time I have been with you, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. And so here we see Jesus again declared oneness with the Father. If you see me, you see the Father. Because I and the Father are one. 
we will now go to section two and it will deals with unbridled blessing and that's verses three through verses 14. verse three how we praise god the father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. And so here again, we see a reminder. Paul reminds his listeners that God is worthy of all the praise who blessed us with all spiritual blessings there in heavenly places. Let's take a look at some of these heavenly blessings. We will look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 20. Philippians 3, verses 20. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Let's take a look at another blessing let's go to hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 it says that is why we have a high priest who has gone to heaven jesus the son of god let us cling to him and never stop trusting him this high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same temptations we do yet he did not sin let's take a look at another one uh, colossians chapter 1 verse 5 because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel so there you have it our citizenship is in heaven our high priest is in heaven and our hope is in heaven these are the inheritance that we have because of our faith in jesus christ we are complete in christ because of who we are in him and who he is, we are complete in him. And that is why, that is why a person without Christ has no life, none whatsoever. They are just existing. There's no life in them. Life is only in Jesus Christ, our faith in Christ, gives us life in him. Back to the lesson, verse 4, Ephesians 1, verse 4. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And so here, again, we, we're, we, we're seeing that the Apostle Paul says, God chose us. So to emphasize that salvation depends totally on God, he, he chose us. We didn't choose him. We're, again, we're dead. We, we came here, D-O-A, dead on arrival. We have no life without Christ. So God chose us. We are not saved because we deserve it. No, only because God has chosen us and freely, freely gives us salvation. So throughout the Bible, we have seen different kinds of elections. We have seen in the Old Testament where God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people. We also have seen 
how he has chosen from the tribe of Levi to be his priest. And here, Paul here is telling us of this election of salvation, which is by God's sovereign election, only by God's choice. We have nothing to do with it. Our only doing is to believe and receive. Second half said we are chosen in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. You know, God's desire is always for everyone to be saved. Because we are chosen in Christ, we're also blameless in him, in him. You know, Paul here, uh, he refers to our position, our position, not so much our practice, because you know what? We, we, we are nowhere near being blameless in our everyday living. We are far from that holy standard and we are far from being blameless, but yet Paul says, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Verse 10, Colossians 2 and verse 10. And you are complete through your union with Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you come to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. That is why our salvation is secure. Having Christ's perfect righteousness, that is why we should strive. This is, we have the nature of Christ because of whom we are in him. We now has his nature in us. So the least we can do is strive, strive to live our lives to reflect, to reflect the holiness and blamelessness that are in our destiny. We have it in us, in Christ. We have to strive to reflect it. We're, we're not going to be blameless because we're still in that sinful body, but we can at least strive and aim to do it. Verse 5, Ephesians 1 verse 5, His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. And again here, Paul lets us know that God elects those who are saved. And it is because of his love. And again, God's unchanging plan is another way of saying that salvation is God's work and not our own doing. In his infinite love, God has adopted us as his own children through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has brought us into his family and made us a part of his family. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. And so when we think about the word adopted, it, it carries the same privileges as a biological child has. And here we see Paul uses this term to show how strong our relationship to God is. And it also says God has great pleasure doing it. Verse 6, so we praise God for the wonderful kindness he has poured out on us because we belong to his 
dearly loved son. Jesus Christ is our redeemer from sin. He paid the price for our release. Jesus died and paid the price for our sin. Release us from the bondage of sin and from death. And now we have been made one with him by faith and placed in his body. We too are now acceptable to God as his beloved children. 7. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son and our sins are forgiven. You know, the blood of Jesus Christ, it points to at least two very, very important truths, redemption and forgiveness. So the term redemption was used back in the Old Testament, where in uh, Leviticus chapter 25, we see that uh, redemption was the price paid to gain freedom for a slave. Then in the New Testament, through his death, Jesus paid the price to release us from slavery to sin. Now let's look at forgiveness. Forgiveness was granted in the Old Testament times on the basis of the shedding of animals blood and we can see that in Leviticus chapter 17. Now we are forgiven. We are now forgiven on the basis of the shedding of Jesus's blood. He died as the perfect and final sacrifice. If we take a look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Romans 5. Let's start with verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God shows, showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's judgment. Verse 10. For since we were restored to friendship with God by the death of his son while we were still his enemies we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life you know Jesus died for our sin but until until one realizes his or her need for redemption, he or she will never seize the need for a redeemer, meaning Christ, until there's a realization that he or she is hopelessly enslaved to sin. One will never seek the release from it. And again, without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins and therefore releases us from the enslavement to sin and the wrath of God upon sin. Verse 8. He has showered his kindness on us. Along with all wisdom and understanding. So here verse 8. Not only let us know that God has forgiven us. But also that he has given us all the necessary equipment to understand him to live a life, to serve him daily, living a life of reflecting his will 
and doing the things that is pleasing in his sight. He has given us the necessary equipment to do it. His wisdom and his understanding and his love. Verse 9. God's sacred plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And so here, verse 9 and 10, lets us know that God was not intentionally keeping his plan sacred, but his plan for the world could not be fully understood until Christ rose from the dead. His purpose for sending Christ to begin with was to unite Jews and Gentiles in a one body with Christ as the head. And so we may not understand in fullness God's plan right now, but we know that one day all people will know the plan of God because every knee shall bow and confess to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 and 10, it says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you hear that? Every, not some, every knees shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Back to the lesson, verse 11. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us from the beginning, and all things happen just as he decided long ago. And so here, verse 11 lets us know that God has chosen us from the beginning. You know, God knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin. That was not a surprise to him. He knew and he put a redemptive plan in place from the beginning to redeem us back, to reconcile us back to him, to restore back fellowship to him because he loves us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that, his, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was from the beginning. We, we are seated in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And that is how secure our eternal hope is in Christ. Verse 12, God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. And so here again, Paul lets us know that because of who we are, because we are his chosen people, we should be praising the Lord and glorifying him. Not just sometimes, but, but as a lifestyle. We should make it a lifestyle to glorify the Lord. Jesus is uh, he he served as our perfect example of giving God glory. When, when Jesus fulfilled the will of God on the cross, remember what he said in John chapter 13. And start look at verse 31. He says, as so, and it says, as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for me the son of man to enter into my glory and God will receive glory because of all that happens to me. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross 
it brought glory to the Father. And we know Jesus was obedient even unto death. That's a perfect example for, for us to follow his example that whatever we do for Christ will last. And it is whatever we're doing for him is bringing him glory because this world is dark and they need to see the light. And when we stand on the truth and stand on God's word, somebody will see something that will cause them to come. The goal is for this dark world to come, to see something and come, to turn, to turn from their wicked ways, to repent, just like we did. We repented one day and God saved us. And now we have an obligation to look back and let somebody know that if he did it for me, he can also do it for you. Amen. Verse 13. And now you also have heard the truth. The good news that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identifies you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. And here again, we're seeing how God's truth can only be revealed through Jesus Christ. For one, it must be heard. For two, it must be believed to bring salvation. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. It has to be a hearing. Romans 10 and 17 lets us know. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the key principles again here uh, of finding salvation is faith. And that's based on hearing and the preaching based on the word. Hearing of the word. Verse 14, Ephesians 1 verse 14 the Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us everything He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. This is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. Here we see that the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee. God guarantees that we belong to him and that he will do what he has promised the holy spirit is like a down payment a deposit a, a validating signature on on a contract so to speak and so we're we're there's a guarantee we're sealed by the holy spirit the word see, seal seal would denote not only our identification, but our, but also our ownership and, and the protection that God provided for us because of who we are in Christ. The sealing of the Holy Spirit guarantees the benefits of our salvation. You know, just as a person, you just like you, you're mailing off a letter and, and you seal the envelope, it guarantees that whatever inside that envelope is secure. That's how we are secured in what God has promised us in his word. And, and also the Holy Spirit empowers us and work, work in us to transform us and to change us to become to become more like Christ that is the job of the holy spirit none of us can change ourselves we need the power of the holy spirit to change us to transform us and as paul says in romans 12 verse 1 and 2 be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind we need the holy spirit to work on our minds. So as we close, as we close this lesson, we see here Paul has set forth 
the amazing and unlimited blessings that believers have in Christ, blessing that amount to our our personal inheritance. You know, when we have a person, we have to take it personal. When we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to take it personal and see how this applies to us, not only collectively, but individually. The only reason why our lives here on earth is different is because of who we are in Christ and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. He enables us and equips us for what we're doing. He is our helper, our advocate. He protects us and encourages us. He also guarantees our inheritance in Christ. He bears witness with our spirit. That's what Paul says in Romans 8 and 16. Romans 8 and verse 16. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are God's children. Did you hear that? We need the Holy Spirit. And this will conclude our lesson. If you have heard something that was helpful to you, please give a like, share, subscribe, or even leave a comment. But most importantly, remember, we are building the kingdom of God together one lesson at a time. God bless you. Until next time. Bye-bye.